Well, as the school year starts back up here in the United States, I wanted to start this year's vlog off with a challenge. Now, it's a challenge to look at how you are teaching mathematics this year. And I want you to specifically be paying attention to how you are developing mathematical proficiency. Now, it's a challenge that will be difficult, for some of you, some of you may already be doing this, but it's also a challenge that will encourage you to do something that might be a bit uncomfortable. It's to teach math without a textbook. I'm Christina Tonneville, The Recovering Traditionalist, and I hope you'll stick around for this as we investigate developing mathematical proficiency, why you shouldn't be teaching math through a textbook in our quest to build our math minds so that we can build the math minds of our students. Now, there are two resources that have totally influenced my belief that we can teach mathematics without textbooks. The first one I want to talk to you about is the book Adding It Up. Now, it was first published back in 2001, but it is still oh so relevant. One of the big pieces that came out of adding it up was this graphic about strands of proficiency. Now, these are interwoven strands of proficiency. And this is what I wanted to start off with is what does it actually mean to develop mathematical proficiency? Because all too often, our idea of developing mathematical proficiency is we get through a textbook and then we give them the test at the end of the year. And if they perform well on that test, then we think that they are mathematically proficient. Even our tests will say that they're proficient or not proficient. Like those are terminology that we use a lot in standardized tests. But what really makes up that proficiency? And this is an image that should be still very much out there, but there are a lot of people who have never ever seen this. So let's take a look at what this means. Okay. So one of the first ones is conceptual understanding. You guys have probably heard me talk about this a lot, that conceptual understanding is not just knowing how to do something, but it's understanding the why behind it. Then procedural fluency is that being able to do it. We do need kids to be able to get the right answer and to have proficient and effective efficient ways to get to that answer, right? A lot of kids will develop this conceptual understanding, but still not be very fluent with procedures. So these go hand in hand, as I talked about. These are interwoven. You cannot have just one and feel like your kids are being proficient. They need all five of these. So conceptual understanding is knowing how it all works. Why does it work? Procedural fluency is being able to do the work, knowing how to do it. And then the next one is strategic competency. This is basically problem solving, right? Is seeing things in a context and being able to solve the problem. But here's the deal. All too often our textbooks have this view of problem solving, of we give you the problem, you have to pull out the information and, and solve the problem. But in real life, all too often the mathematical problems we encounter, we don't even realize what the problem is. Like we have to take all of this extraneous information and then figure out what the problem really is. So even though our textbooks will line out problem solving, it's not a true reflection of what real problem solving is actually like for our students out in the real world. Now, the next one is adaptive reasoning. This is where kids can be able to reason and explain and justify. They can look and reflect about their understanding versus someone else's understanding and, and make connections between those. The last piece, which is often something that is forgotten, is productive disposition. This is where kids actually see math as sensible, useful, and worthwhile. It's also about one's own ability to do the math and believing that we can do the math. Now, this is kind of... Um, this is the one that hits home for me because I feel like my own kids, my four kids, have the first four 
of these things. But even today, when I'm recording this, it is the first day back to school for my kids. And one of my sons said it right in the car on the way to school. I hate math. Right? Like that right there tells you that we are not developing mathematical proficiency. If their view of mathematics is that it's boring, it's dumb, why do I have to do this? We are not developing true mathematical proficiency. And I've got to tell you that one of the things that I feel like does this to kids is our textbooks. It like sucks the life out of mathematics. And I want you to bring the life back to mathematics for your students, for yourself, right? All too often textbooks are just so boring to teach out of. Right? So I know that there are good parts of textbooks. Don't get me wrong. There are great parts about having a textbook and following and knowing that you are kind of getting through the material. That is comforting to know, but it also doesn't build this true mathematical proficiency for a lot of our students. Now, this brings me to another piece of what's in the adding it up, because it's not just about these concepts of mathematics, these strands of proficiency. What it also talks about is how do we actually do that in the classroom? And they talk a lot about something known as the instructional triangle. It's the interaction among teachers, students, and the mathematics, all three of those, inside of a context. Right? So I'll bring up the visual that they use in that book. So yes, you can use your textbook as the context that you are doing this interaction between, but all too often the textbook is seen as the one and only resource and guide that you must follow. It's often unidirectional interaction just between the textbook, like you start with the textbook, the teacher reads the information, they take that information, then they give it to the students. That's the interaction that happens. But instead, it needs to be this triangle where they're all working together. The teachers interacting with the mathematics, helping the students interact. Students are interacting together. <clears throat> they're interacting with the mathematics without the teacher involvement. There are times that teachers get involved and interact, like it's all going back and forth. And all the while, the context is on the outside, giving us a way to think about and view the mathematics. One of the big parts of this triangle that is so important for students to understand is, to, is helping build that disposition and understanding that they are in control of their learning. One of the reasons kids have a bad disposition about mathematics is that it is one of those things where it's top down. The teacher says, we're learning this today. And even if you already know this stuff or you're not ready for this stuff, you're still learning it, right? So the idea of having the kids help be in control of their learning is a big part of this triangle. The students must interact with the mathematics, the teachers and the other students, and teachers should use those interactions to help shape the learning of mathematics. Now, how do we actually do that? Well, that brings me to my second resource that made a huge difference in my understanding of how we teach mathematics, and it's cognitively guided instruction. Now, I first learned of cognitively guided instruction when the research, so the big research papers that came out about cognitively guided instruction back in the mid 90s. Okay, It has been around a long time, and it's originally was a professional development program, but has turned into a massive movement. And it's not something I can do justice in these little videos, so I'll definitely link to some of the major research and of course the book, Children's Mathematics, Cognitively Guided Instruction, so whichever way, if you want to read an article or read the book, I'll link to that underneath this video. But basically, the underlying idea was to help teachers understand the development of children's thinking and then use that to drive their instruction. And in particular, they focused on how children intuitively solve word problems. And they started with how children would solve these without any 
instruction. And then they train teachers to understand how to use students' thinking to pick the next thing they were going to do, to guide their instruction. Now, one of the interesting pieces that I wanna bring up with you about cognitively guided instruction is the research that they discovered from this. They compared the group of teachers, students, who were part of cognitively guided instruction with students who were in more traditional, like classrooms where they focus on computation and worksheets and that kind of stuff. And so in that research, what they discovered was that kids who were in CGI type classrooms performed just as well as the other kids on basic computation stuff. But when it came to problems and tests that involved problem solving, guess what? The CGI kids scored way better than the compare group of students who were from the more traditional style of teaching. So even though the emphasis in CGI classrooms was not on number skills and computation, they still did just as well, but were way better at problem solving and thinking. Cognitively guided instruction is just such a powerful way to approach the teaching and learning of mathematics. So what does this all mean? And why am I telling you this stuff? Well, what I wanted to do in this video is to encourage you to teach math in a way that focuses on those strands of proficiency, as well as you're using your students' thinking to guide your instruction, not the textbook. Too often we are just going lesson by lesson without considering if it's the best thing for our students. As I like to say, fidelity to your students is greater than fidelity to your textbook. Now, if your textbook is great and those strands of proficiency are in there and it also has you paying attention to student thinking and using that to guide the instruction, then by all means, keep with it. But my guess is it doesn't. So I want to encourage you that if it isn't, it's time to start thinking about changing that. Now, How do I suggest you do that? Well, that's to come. I can't fit it all in one video. So next week, I'm gonna give you my top suggestions on how to make those changes. And then I'm gonna have future videos as well that go a little bit more deep into my recommendations. But for right now, I just want you to consider that the teaching of mathematics can and should be different for our students. And the way that we do that is by focusing on those strands of proficiency and starting to use our students' thinking to guide the instruction, not the textbook. So I hope that this video has helped you build your math mind so that you are ready to go build those math minds of your students. Have a great day.